Welcome to Indie Film Forum. I'm your host, Kalpana Biswas. I'm delighted to introduce you today to Heather Arnett, feminist, philanthropist, and filmmaker, a great granddaughter of Mary Rosenberg, a suffragette who boldly marched in New York for women's voting rights more than a century ago. Heather carries the torch in her own advocacy for equity and security for women and girls nationally and internationally. She is CEO of the reputed Women and Girls Foundation and board chair of the Miss Foundation for Women. Heather's first documentary film, Madam Presidenta, Why Not US, explores why so many countries, including Brazil, have elected female presidents and not the US. She has appeared on all major news channels and has published op-eds at the Huffington Post, Daily Beast, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and Pittsburgh Business Times. I'm happy to welcome Heather Arnett to my show today. Welcome, Heather, and uh, I am so interested in the advocacy work that you're doing. I love the fact that you've drawn this line from your great-grandmother, Mary Rosenberg, and uh, the suffragettes, and you're carrying the torch, and your grandmother, and now you. Uh, what has this journey been like? Uh, the journey of making the film, and the journey of, of, of me as a filmmaker. <laughs> Those are two, two different and you know conflating journeys. So. The film really has been a beautiful experience because it's been a way to bring my my family stories, you know, to the forefront, and also work with the organization here, the Women and Girls Foundation, that I care so much about, and really bring the issues that they work on um, up as well. So, Women and Girls Foundation works to empower women, develop the female leaders of tomorrow, increase women's uh, leadership. And so this is a film about women presidents, so it very much serves that mission, and we've been taking it to schools and universities. Uh, but then personally, it fulfills this uh, much more uh, personal desire to see my grandmother, so Vivian, who was the daughter of Mary, um, you know, she really had this dream to see a woman president in her lifetime. And when I first started to meet, make the film, she was in her uh, mid-90s, and she had uh, just seen Hillary Clinton not be successful in that run. And, you know, lots of people know about that particular run, but 50 women have run for President of the United States in my grandmother's lifetime. So it really was a question of when would she ever get to see it, and if not, why? Why was the U.S. finding it so difficult to do what so many other countries have been able to do? So I found the question itself really fascinating. One of the interesting um parts of your film was also the the fact that there's an environment that sort of uh, helps and encourages women uh, to uh, become aware of their own uh, strengths of their own you know sense of power yeah. uh, how did that happen when you were growing up I mean I am very fortunate to come from a family of lots of different kinds of strong women uh, so my grandmother Vivian and her mother Mary are really showcased in the film um, but they are on my father's side actually uh, my own mother is quite wonderful, and she was, a, uh, for most of our growing up, really was a single mother raising kids on her own, and, um, you know, with a little bit of support, of course, from my father, but, you know, they were divorced, and she really had full-time custody and responsibility, and when she first uh, had my brother, who's a few years older than I am, uh, she, you know, hadn't gone to college, and so in her 20s found herself as a mom with two kids, no college degree, you know, no husband, and... Uh, trying to find ways to be economically self-sufficient. So I watched her as a very young child. I watched her going to school at night, working during the day, you know, raising two kids, 
getting herself from food stamps to, to having a job. And, and she worked so hard. And I think, you know, many, many people who are children of single mothers, you know, you grow up with such a respect for the women who go through that. Uh, it's hard to be a single parent, you know, male or female, and it's a hard job to be a parent. Uh, so my mother really instilled in me this kind of strength, and I also watched her struggle. Uh, and we also lived in an um, Orthodox Jewish community, that's my ba background, and, uh, and that can be a very stifling community for women as well. And so I saw the women in my life, my grandmothers, my mother, trying to navigate this work world that was really structured for men and a religious structure that was structured for them and trying to find their own way and their own place. And so I think, you know, as a young girl and then going into to my adult years, it just felt like whatever they had accomplished, it was my responsibility to take it to the next place and then, you know, pass the baton to the next person to take it to the next place. So you started with the CMU, uh, you graduated from there, you, you studied drama. Um, how much of the experience that you had, your childhood, went into your uh, next phase as um, a, a director in theater and uh, you know, in the selection of the, the kinds of topics that you wanted to work with? Yeah, so I, um, I first came to the theater as an actor when I was very little. So I was four years old, I think, when I had my first professional <laughs> acting uh, job. And so I was an actor, and I did, you know, all sorts of kids theater and those kinds of things. And so when I first applied to Carnegie Mellon, I really thought that acting was still what I was going to be pursuing. Uh, but then actually when I read about more of the departments at Carnegie Mellon, I remember I was reading about the Literary and Cultural Studies program, which I ended up double majoring in. and. I was fascinated because the way that that was described was learning to look at text in its cultural framework and think about it in a cultural context, right? And, I, and that's really what I think good directors do. You know, you, if you, certainly if you haven't written the text, you get a play and you have to think, you know, what did this text mean when it was written? What does it mean to the times we are in now? And how will I present the connection of those two things on stage? And so, you know, and, and in directing class, you learn a lot of the technical elements of directing, and those are critically important. But I find that uh, everything I learned in the Literary and Cultural Studies department really feeds a huge part of my own directing style. And from a feminist standpoint or political standpoint, you know, when I mentioned my mother, when I was little and they would assign a project uh, to us, you know, read a biography of a painter or a composer or an explorer, you know, in those very early elementary school years, she always made sure that we would go to the library and find a book on a female painter or a female explorer or a female, you know, comp composer. And in those days, there really weren't a lot of children's biographies of women in those categories. And so if we couldn't find one, she'd take me to the adult section and we'd find one and then we'd read it together. And so I think from her, she really instilled in me this, this core value, right, of seeking out female leadership and then modeling it out. And so from the very beginning at Carnegie Mellon, my freshman director's statement, in fact, said that my mission would be to raise up women's voices and engage audiences in very current topics impacting women's lives. And so I think that you know, I've continued to do that through theater and film and through my philanthropic work. Let's go on to talk about uh, Madame Presidenta. Let's, let's show a clip and then, uh, then talk about it. This is my grandmother Vivian in 1979. This was me in 1979. This is us now. Women like Victoria Woodhull, Shirley Chisholm, Bella Abzug, Gloria Steinem, these are some of our heroes. Women who championed women's rights with courage and conviction. This is my great grandmother, Mary. When I was growing up, my grandmother Vivian would regale me with stories of her mother Mary, the suffragette, who marched the streets of New York for women to earn the right to vote. One hundred years later, I'm proud to be carrying on her legacy as the CEO of the Women and Girls Foundation, engaging women and girls in political activism. 
You see, my grandmother's dream, passed down from her mother, was to someday elect the first woman president. In my grandmother's lifetime, over 50 women ran for president of the United States. At age 93, she thought she would finally see her dream come true. But history had other plans. To those who are disappointed that we couldn't go all the way, especially the young people who put so much into this campaign, it would break my heart if in falling short of my goal, I in any way discouraged any of you from pursuing yours. As we gather here today in this historic, magnificent building, the 50th woman to leave this earth is orbiting overhead. If we can blast 50 women into space, we will someday launch a woman into the White House. Just two years after Hillary Clinton put 18 million cracks in the American glass ceiling, Dilma Rousseff was sworn in as the 36th president of Brazil. This is Brazil Today, a new democracy preparing to host the World Cup in 2014 and the Olympics in 2016, trying to keep its economy on the rise and poverty rates in decline. Women are leading energy companies, engineering technologies, and entering the presidential palace. So when I go to Brazil and I talk to the women and girls there who are, who are getting to see their first female president, what should I ask them? How in the hell did you do that? How did they manage to succeed where we didn't? That's a good question. How did they do it? How is it that Brazil and dozens of other countries have been able to elect a female president years before the United States? And what difference can a president have anyway? on our country and on women's rights. I was going to Brazil to find out. I had a dream last night. So many colors, so much Vendo mães com filhas pequenas, né, puxando mesmo o guarda-chuva com as suas capinhas, e eu percebi assim todo o movimento, olha, vamos para lá, todas as mulheres, uma chamando a outra. Então assim, um momento de muita emoção, muito foi muito lindo e sobretudo de ver muitas jovens, muitas meninas, né, ali naquele momento histórico de ver a Dilma com a sua filha. Então, ali, de certa forma, elas pegam aquilo para si e falam: "Eu posso" Eu vou fazer igual, né? Quem sabe no futuro eu que vou estar ali naquele lugar. Queridas brasileiras, queridos brasileiros. Eu estou feliz como raras vezes estive na minha vida pela oportunidade que a história me deu de ser a primeira mulher a governar o Brasil. é presidente do Brasil, eu acho que a gente nem imagina, não avalia ainda o que isso vai representar. Eu que viajo muito de norte a sul, porque a gente tem loja em quase todo o Brasil, eu tenho certeza que é uma mudança de paradigma muito grande. Os homens machistas vão acreditar muito mais depois da presidente Dilma. Eu acho que é uma... mudar paradigma não é fácil. E, e você conseguir pôr a primeira, uma das primeiras mulheres presidente do Brasil, para o Brasil vai representar muito, já está representando, e para o mundo todo vai representar muito. Olha, as mulheres é, é importante em todos os sentidos, porque no, na, no samba, as mulheres são fundamentais, 
Se é numa roda de samba, as mulheres são importantes. Se é numa uma festa, as mulheres também são, porque sem as mulheres nada acontece. Eu acho que ter uma mulher na presidência é muito importante. Você não é só na presidência. Agora é mulher, é PM, é na Colurbe, enfim, a mulher está tendo que abrir um espaço e está sendo aproveitada, em todos os sentidos. Para mim, como eu, é, nós mulheres negras, moradoras de, de comunidade carente, assim, o preconceito... É, sem, não tem, não, não tem nem como expressar quantos preconceitos nós já passamos, né? Por ser mulher, por ser negra, mas assim, com a chegada da Dilma mostrou que nós mulheres podemos chegar lá. Ou se não chegar lá, chegar em algum lugar maior do que a gente pensava anteriormente, assim. Eu acho que pra, pra mim me dá força de, de continuar lutando, batalhando como eu sempre fui batalhadora e sempre batalho. Heather, how challenging was it to make this film? Um, going to Brazil, a, a whole different culture for you, to understand the, the nuances, to understand the, uh, the different strands of uh, feminism that you see. If you're going to another country to make a film, there are a whole host of things to, to do. And one of the most important was for us, I really had a colleague who lives in Brazil and who works for the Women's Fund there and who, like myself, has a background in communications and television production. So she, her name is Veronica Marquez, really was critical to the film happening because she was able to help line up, uh, you know, the kinds of folks that we would meet with. We went back and forth for months and months and months. You know, she would gather bios and tell me about people and we'd try and talk about, we wanted to make sure to have a real diverse mix of, of people from different communities and neighborhoods and socioeconomic stratas and politi politicians and activists and just everyday folks. And um, so Veronica was key to line those up as well as, you know, we had a local crew. Uh, Nathan Golan, our cinematographer, and myself were the, the Americans who came uh, from here, but everybody else was local. And uh, so, so that was key and certainly, you know, having the van and, and um, uh, is security when necessary, depending on where we were, which we needed very, very little of. Um, and so also permits, uh, you, know, it, you know, we need them here, but trying to navigate that in another country would have been quite impossible. So, um, so all of that, like any other filmmaker, you know, you want to have a local fixer on the ground who knows everything, you know, knows the, com the culture and uh, has the connections that you need to be able to get your work done. What did you see in, in the process that made you feel that, yes, they've come a longer way than people over here? <laughs> yeah. Well, Brazil is such a fascinating country, right? So, I mean, especially when we were there in 2013, 2012, 2013, uh, Dilma was first elected in the very end of, 10, of 2010. So she's about two years into her term. The nation itself is, you know, this nation on the rise. They are now experiencing um, a, a bit of a recession. But at the time, the whole rest of the world was in recession except for Brazil. Um, now, of course, they're just experiencing it now, so I don't think they were, you know, saved from it. But it was fascinating to be someplace where they were economically booming while the rest of the country, while the rest of the world was not. And they were doing that through social investment as well, whereas you heard so much about austerity in other countries. Uh, they were investing in education, they were investing in healthcare, they were investing in bringing uh, electricity to poor communities. I think for very young women and for little girls, to have the image of a woman in the presidency is very important. I think that Dilma is worried about women's human rights. I think that she is not going to do all that all that she wants to do, and all that the the, the minister of of uh, women's issue wants to do, because in four years is. It's very uh, difficult to change 500 years of history of Brazil. But she is going to do what, what she can, and she is going to, 
to leave the basis for the next one that is going to be in the presidency to do what he or she has to do. Protests, revolutions, military dictatorships, war, peace, and reconciliation. Dilma herself having been imprisoned and tortured as a girl in her early 20s, fighting to bring about Brazil's new era of democracy. Several weeks into my visit, I was still wrestling to discover how women had been positioned to take on leadership here despite these uncertain times. I could not help but wonder, did the establishment of the new democracy and the dismantling of the old system provide fertile ground and opportunities for women to succeed? The feminist movement has, has, has made a huge impact in the, not only impact, it has been extremely involved in the process of, 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 of democratization, but also in the process of seeking a more just and, and equal society. And the, the efforts of, of, of the women's movement in, in, in health issues and in, in politics and in all areas, I think, have, have changed and educated society. And therefore, young women are changing their ideas of themselves and women are more aware. It is politically correct for you to think that you're an empowered woman. All your viewers might not know this, but Brazil was a democracy, it was a military dictatorship, it's gone through different times, and it was a military dictatorship. And uh, when Dilma was in college, she became a Marxist guerrilla, she was fighting for the democracy, she was arrested, she was tortured for three years. And so um, she is someone who absolutely fought to bring about democracy. And so learning about her and other women like her, uh, be bringing about democracy, helping to write their constitution, I think that these things really planted seeds in my head to think about how have women been involved in those ways in other nations, uh, and, and might there be some correlation? We'll show a, a clip of uh, the, the, the key finding yes, um, right. that you sort of stumbled upon. Women were really active in what was called the Constituente in, uh, in 1988. Uh, a number of the leaders of the women's movement had been in exile during the authoritarian period. A number of them came back having experienced living in Europe or living in the United States or living in other countries in Latin America. Uh, or the world, where they had the access to social movements and uh, policy processes that were beginning to uh, consolidate women's rights and human rights uh, overall, what was called the movement for citizenship in Brazil at the time. Eu penso que este foi um grande momento das mulheres brasileiras, mulheres de todas as raças, mulheres de todos os segmentos sociais e que na Constituição brasileira viram é, de que não dava para continuar como é, 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 tínhamos, por exemplo, coisas que nós observamos, e aí enquanto mulher negra, nós não existíamos na Constituição, de forma a garantir que no meio de comunicação pudesse ter mulheres brancas, mulheres negras, homens negros, homens indígenas, essa representação. Nós observamos durante todo esse debate, toda essa construção, de que para o pobre, para o negro, não bastava estudar. Ele tinha que ter um QI. E esse QI era quem indicasse. E esse quem indicasse passava pela cor da pele. Então era preciso ter uma constituição com a cara do Brasil. Nós como garotas, how fascinating to meet with Benedita da Silva and hear about how she and dozens of women participated in the drafting of Brazil's 1988 constitution. I wondered if the other countries that currently had elected female presidents also had new constitutions, and if women had participated in those processes too. If so, that might be an important clue on my quest to answer Vivian's questions. Brazil, Germany, India, Liberia, Kosovo? It would seem these countries had little in common, yet every single one of the countries that currently has an elected female president also has a new constitution, written or revised since World War II. And in almost all cases, women were involved as activists, advocates, or even active participants in the drafting of these new constitutions. From women like Dilma who fought in resistance movements, to the women in Liberia negotiating the peace to end genocide. Women across the globe have had the opportunity
to shape their own democracies. They have demanded that these new constitutions include items that support female advancement, like political quotas, paid maternity leave, and support for reproductive and economic rights. Compare this with our own American Revolution and the stories of the Founding Fathers drafting the U.S. Constitution in 1776 without a single mother in the room. And it started to become clear that as a nation, we had some catching up to do. We've never had a woman as president of the United States. And I hope we will in my lifetime, and I'm sure we will at my lifetime. So I think given how aware we are uh, of what's going on around the world, the fact that there is a woman president of a large and vibrant um, uh, country is hugely important. You know, it's that, that now old saying, we cannot be what we cannot see. So women's leadership, interesting, is much more visible in other places in the world than it is here in the United States. Certainly. I'm not exactly suggesting that we rewrite our constitution or we'll never have a woman president. And that's not at all the, the point of the film. But I think and I hope that this film is a call to action for all of us, but especially for women, to become active participants in shaping our democracy. You know, we are only going to be written into the laws of our country if we come to the table as lawmakers, if we make sure that our voices as activists are heard. Um, that's the only way that these things will happen. And I, of course, very much want to see a woman president and see my grandmother's dreams come true. Uh, but I think it's not just about fixating on this one leadership position. It's about thinking about how are we supporting women's advancement and the empowerment of girls at all levels of our society. And if we do that, then I know we will have a woman president. So it, it starts with taking your little girls to yes, uh, the voting booths, yes, or, or the libraries, or biographies, or biographies absolutely. to the voting booth. So how do people get to see more of your work? <laughs> uh, well, they can go to madampresidenta.com, and we're really excited because we have a new relationship with Gather Films, and so the way that Gather works is people can go to the website and put in their zip code and see if there's a screening near them. And if there isn't one, they can actually organize a screening. And uh, it's really great, because Gather will um, bring the film to their community, to a major you know, movie theater in their community. Uh, so we hope people will use Gather and bring the film to, to those places. We also, of course, do private screenings at universities and schools or community groups. We want the film to be out there. And it's a one-hour film, and we really made it to be something that can be followed up with a question and answer period or a panel. We want people to talk about it. I always hope that when you watch the film, you end up not feeling like you now have the answers, but that you have 26 new questions that you never thought about asking about before. What's your next project? Uh, well, that's a really interesting question. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm giving uh, some advice to different projects. I had heard about a project that's in its very infancy uh, involving women athletes and uh, Muslim female athletes and expanding rights for them and, and awareness around that. I'm, of course, very involved in Women and Girls Foundation. And uh, we next week, we'll be taking girls to Harrisburg and encouraging them to run for a future office. So right now, that's, that's where I'm at. Very important work, and I love the topics that uh, you've, you've thought about. Oh, uh, certainly, uh, the Muslim uh, women, I think uh, so they are uh, a lot more work needs to be done there, uh, given what's happening in the world today. Um, so, uh, wonderful, and thank you so much, uh, Heather, for this uh, very um, enlightening uh, conversation. Well, thank you and, for having uh, me. All the best. And thank you for watching Indie Film Forum. I'm Kalpana Biswas. See you again next time. And for more information on Heather Arnett and Indie Film Forum, please visit our websites coming up.